112638, State of Kansas v. Solomon. Mr. Sullivan appears to be counsel Michelle Davis. May I please reserve three minutes for rebuttal? Three minutes is granted. Thank you. Uh, the state prosecuted Mr. Sullivan for several offenses involving three different complainants, and Mr. Sullivan was connected to the events based on a uh, DNA match with the data, national database. So police brought him in for basically interrogation interview. And the state admitted it was one of those typical situations where the police talk to him, and then at some point they decide they're going to take his statement. And so they audio record his statement, and there were two different detectives involved. And so the state admitted um, each statement into evidence. And then the prosecutor, the state wanted to, there had also been a video running um, during much of the time, and the state wanted to. Uh, admit that video into evidence, and the defense said, you know, it's a six hours long video. How, we, how exactly were you gonna do with this? And uh, both the state suggested and the judge agreed that the jury could take the video back during deliberations, and then if the jury wanted to watch it or not, they could, and they would give them a television. And so the basis of our issue here today is that that's not uh, a proper way to present evidence to the jury, uh, and it violated uh, Mr. Sullivan's constitutional rights to a public trial, uh, to have to be present, to have the judge present when evidence is introduced. And we're not, you're not making um, uh, a challenge to the content of the video. Or let me put this another way. Uh, the defense counsel began cross-examining one of the detectives and goes, oh wait, now that video doesn't contain anything inadmissible or bad. Prosecutor says, well, I gave it to you last September. Well, I've slept since then. I don't remember what it says, so can we have a continuance so I can look at it? And the judge allowed her to look at it. The next day before resuming the cross-examination, she says, I've looked at it and there's nothing there I, I, I object to or it's, it's okay. And so that seems to me that you, you, can't, you don't really have a legitimate challenge to the content of the video. That's correct. Okay. That's correct. And so basically what the record would show is that when the state went to admit it, the defense counsel asked for um, a, a conference and uh, the defense counsel says, is the state gonna publish this to the jury? And then that's when the prosecutor said, let them take it back in deliberations, and if they want to watch it, they can. And then that's when the defense counsel said, well, how's the court going to handle this? And if the jury wants to watch something, are we going to have them come back and watch it on the record, assuming come back, meaning come back into the courtroom? And then the judge says, no, no, they'll be given the disc, and we'll send the TV back with them. And uh, then the judge just said he doesn't think that they all had to be present if the jury wanted to watch it. And then the defense counsel said, was there any case law that says that the jury, that this can happen, that the jury can just watch it during deliberations? And then the judge said, um, well, we're not allowed to talk to jurors about their deliberations. So we don't really, so there's really no case law on it. Or, you know, not that there's no case law, but that was the judge's comment. And then at some point the defense counsel, and again, the judge is like, this is okay, this is acceptable, and that's when there at the end, the defense counsel says, but I'm going to object. No, it doesn't really give a basis, though. None of these three constitutional bases have, were advanced at that time. Well, right, because I think at some point, uh, you know, defense counsel felt this was wrong to do it this way. Just felt wrong. <laughs> just felt wrong. Um, I yeah. understand that sometimes it does just feel wrong. What, uh, what do we do with the fact, that, doesn't the record reflect that your client voluntarily absented himself from the courtroom during the... Uh, publication of both audio tapes? That's correct, yes. Um, and had the indication been that your client didn't want to be present for any of those? Um, I mean, he didn't want to be present for those, and I think there were other segments of the trial he also voluntarily absented himself from. Does that have any bearing on your right to be present argument? Well, the right to be present argument, I mean, at least his attorney was present while those audios were being played. And the way but it's this really was about done, the defendant's presence. 
That's the right. right. The right. right isn't to have your lawyer present. The right is to have yourself present as a defendant. Right, and that's really my weakest claim because that's subject to harmless error analysis. It's very difficult. I know this, the burden would be on the state to show that the error was harmless. But from my point of view, that's not a good standard of review for me. The best standard of review here would be the structural error, which is the right to the public trial what and the, the right to have the judge present. I'm sorry. Sorry. What are the limitations of what you're arguing? I mean, we had a case, a totally different context, but kind of a similar issue earlier in the week where mm -hmm. there was a criminal case that dealt with, um, as it was described in the oral argument, I think, stacks of documents that would have gone to the seal, mm -hmm. admitted into evidence. So does the court and a counsel and the jury have to set as uh, each page is reviewed by a jury, the jury to make it a public trial? Right, and I acknowledge that that's what happens, uh, that exhibits get admitted and sent back um, with the jury. I think when a defendant objects, like they did here, I think at some point, uh, yes. I mean, if, if it contains evidence and the state wants the jury to see it and the defendant objects, then yes, I think all that needs to be covered in court and all that needs to be read in court. Usually there's just not an objection. I mean, usually the defense counsel doesn't have, you know, they don't object to it going back well, with the jury for deliberation. Well, there's sort of kind of objection. I'll object, but I'll, I'll respect yeah. the uh, a ruling of the court. Mm -hmm. And then after she viewed the tape, uh, the videotape, she didn't ask to have mm -hmm. it displayed. Mm -hmm. She says, I'm gonna be able to cross-examine the officers, the interrogating officers, over anything on the tape, mm -hmm. aren't I? Yes, you will. Mm -hmm. um, so it, it didn't look a lot like uh, an objectionable situation, although she said did say that one word that one time. Uh, right. I guess I'll object, although I'll respect your ruling. Well, she's kind of, kind of saying I understand your reasoning, but at some point she's trying to protect her client's rights. Right. Right. And so she's by making the objection, you're asserting those rights and you're saying we don't want, you know, we want all that evidence put out in, in, in an open court. But uh, we don't have a confrontation clause problem here, do we? You know, um, because the main the, the two focus is, is the defendant's own statements. Defense counsel had the opportunity to cross-examine the interrogating officers That's at true. Full, full amount. And with respect to the, do you, does one have the right to confront oneself? That's true. Uh, That's true. Uh, so it's really not a constitutional confrontational clause uh, issue. Um, and I don't see, it's not a ju uh, uh, judge's communication uh, like herbal because the judge didn't communicate with the jury. Um, so I, I guess I, I'm, I'm having a little trouble pinpointing what we're really talking about. What, what's the, and, and it was cumulative because, uh, or a good deal of it was cumulative to the audio tapes because they were included in, in that video, right? Right, yeah. that would have been right. So. What, what's what's the harm here? I'm not what's really it? sure on that. I'd have to check. I believe that's right, but I'm not really sure. Well, I believe he's my reading there. is that, they, that the uh, captain or whoever called and told the interrogators, you need to be videoing, and they had already started the audio, like 12 minutes of it. They started the video. They ran it for six hours, including uh -huh. the breaks mm -hmm. from the interrogation. So the audio tapes only included the actual interrogation but the video had the defendant during that whole time, even when no one was with him for the six hours. So the audios were included in the uh, video. Yeah, again, I mean, the harmlessness would be difficult to show here. So I think, again, we're just going back to the principle of you need so, to be putting on evidence in court. And I think this is gonna continue to be a problem because things so much are more recorded now. We're getting a lot of recordings of body cameras, officers at the scene, and the prosecutors want to just give this to the jury and they can take it and watch it because somehow they've got the recordings and they think they need to use it or they need to validate that the police conducted themselves appropriately because they're scared there's somebody on the jury now that doesn't trust the police. 
So it's let, like, let's let just give clarify. them all these recordings and they can look at it and it's, it's going to keep Yeah, I understand where you're going there, but let me clarify what you said. Um, it's mm -hmm. difficult to show um, uh, that it was not harmless. Is that what you were saying in this case? I think harmlessness is just difficult to show because, again, there wasn't anything in particular about the evidence. That, as, you're, as you're already saying, it was missing so in the you're, audio. you're going to have to rely on structural error? That's right. Okay. Yeah, I'd have to right. go with the right to a public trial, right to have, the, when the evidence is presented, that the judge needs to be presiding over that. And this idea that just, well, we have this evidence, we don't want to take up the time to play it in court, but we're going to give it to the jury because we're showing how the police conducted themselves. And so if we have somebody on the jury that goes back in deliberations and starts to question that, They've got the recordings here, and they're recording so so much now. It's not just, and you know, the case law and exhibits, it used to be an exhibit was a photograph or a document. And nowadays, I, you know, I'm having cases where they're sending CDs, discs back with the jury. For, you know, all these records are on discs. And so it's like, well, we admitted them for foundation, and then we have somebody talk about them, and let's just give all the discs to the jury. We don't even know if the jury's looking at them. Um, we have volumes a, of data. We have a statute now that, mm -hmm sort of addresses this, talks about the ability of a jury to view admitted evidence or exhibits in the jury room. And then it even talks about the court providing equipment mm -hmm. necessary. I mean, that to me would be TVs and DVD players, and et cetera. Right, in the court's discretion, 223420. Is, is that statute unconstitutional? Well, the problem you got, and that's why, again, this wasn't, the objection was not made to the taking it back. The objection was made to the, it being admitted at all, right? And so admitted the, without publishing. Admitted without publishing, that's correct. <laughs> Thank you. And so the way the statute reads, it says jury may take admitted exhibits, which counsel in this case objected to it being admitted. And there it says where they may review. And I'm reading review to mean they've already viewed it. Um, and then the court may provide it to facilitate review. And then again, it also says the court may grant jury's request to rehear testimony. And again, I'm reading that rehear, like they've already heard it once. But even that sentence doesn't say it has to be done in open court. I mean, theoretically, the jury could, you know, rehear so testimony in chambers. There's nothing that says all this has to come out and happen in open court. So to me, this isn't this isn't a statutory problem. Right. It's, it's, I was just analogizing from the statute. But I think you've helped clarify, at least for me, your your particular issue here is not with not necessarily with the fact that the jury viewed it in the jury room, but that it wasn't presented in court. In court. Yeah, and, and you know, the whole idea of a public trial is so that guarantee that judicial even-handedness, prosecutorial uh, zealousness doesn't become Was that excessive. It's all the right of the public trial is to protect the defendant, that, 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 that things are done fairly. And, and you think it. that um, objection was properly preserved? based on the context of their discussions. Okay. Yes. As I understand your answer to Justice Johnson's question about um, the harmlessness and that your answer is that you're asking for structural error here. I think that's the only way to reverse the convictions, yes. Which causes me to revisit our discussion, which as mm -hmm. I understood it, you left it as, uh, rather than for us to expect the publication to take the time of looking through what might be warehouses of documents in mm -hmm. some cases, mm -hmm. that it would depend upon an objection. How can structural error depend upon whether something's objected right. to or not? I understand that, and it doesn't. But I'm saying that what the objection does, I'm not saying it's always going to be structural error. Um, there may be a point. What, what the objection's doing is it's putting on notice that this all needs to get brought out. Right? I don't know that it's necessarily structural error for it all to go back. But in this case, where a defendant objects and they say, we want this evidence to be put, I'm preserving my right to a public trial. I think that's what that's the touchstone at that point. Because you're right, there's going to be times where they're not going to object and they don't think it's important evidence and they don't care. It goes back with the jury. But in a case like that, this, where they think it is important, they should be, evidence should be presented in public. And defense counsel has that concern. And I think that's where... I think it's different from a situation, for example, where, you know, the judge just arbitrarily says, I'm closing the courtroom, right? And so there's no public trial. 
And so the defense counsel wouldn't have to object then because it's structural error. It's, or even if defense counsel said, it's okay with me if you close the courtroom, right? You can't invite that kind of error. Or if the judge just says, I'm gonna go back to chambers, you go on with the trial and you know, come find me if there's an objection and defense counsel says, that's fine. That's still the kind of invited error that's, that you can't, you can't invite that error. But I think we're kind of in more of a, we're not in that black and white kind of situation here. I'm sorry, so is the answer it is structural error or not? I'm saying it is structural error, but I think that the, the objection is key here. In order but how, to, I, I don't understand that. Because I think this is a structural that, error is, right. is a deal that, I mean, the way I've always right. understood it, maybe you can enlighten me, is that structural error is done, you're done. Whether somebody objected, didn't object, all right. of that makes no difference. It's just right. a flaw that's so serious, a conviction must be reversed in Right, but I'm not trying to say that it's structural error where everything that goes back to the jury, every single word has to be read out loud in court. I'm not saying that's structural error, if that doesn't happen. Which well, is why I'm understanding your question, Justice Lukert. It's like just everything that goes back, somehow if it isn't published in a courtroom, you know, somehow you're giving evidence. But that's evidence. your complaint here, is that mm -hmm. you just finished answering a question to my left here, that, uh -huh. that the real complaint wasn't the playing, whatever did or didn't happen in the jury room, because mm -hmm. we, we don't know. And in fact, the record indicates there's no way they could have watched the whole tape because they only deliberated for two and a half hours. Mm -hmm. um, but that's not what you're really complaining about. What you're really complaining about is that it wasn't published, that it wasn't played in court. Right, and at this point, he's asserting that right. And, and you know, I don't know how else to distinguish it between the blatant structural error and then to just say, well, this is harmless, because if we're gonna say this is harmless, then there's no, they can just send back anything they want over objection, and it'll be very difficult to show how it's harmful to a defendant. Well, so there was some never, point there's gotta be- There was never a request to, to publish the video. The defense never asked. Well, to, by the objection they did, they, they object, not specifically, and I'm sorry, just Johnson, I cut you off. No, I, I uh, uh, they, the objection was to the admission at the time they were talking about admitting and how they were going to do it. But subsequently, when she talked about the content, mm -hmm. then looked at it, um, and then says, I'm going to use this, I'm going to use this mm -hmm. evidence to cross-examine, um, there, was, there was never a, a request to, to publish that to the jury. Right, the objection was, I don't, it, it was the admission without publication. That, it, that, that was the objection. So it wasn't that the defense wanted the jury to hear this. The defense counsel just didn't want it, it to be brought in this, in this manner. Because, I mean, the court of appeals said, well, the defense could have played this, right? And they could have, or they could have played portions of it, but that wasn't the point. What, what defense counsel wanted was this exhibit should not have been admitted. If it wasn't gonna get played in court by the state, that doesn't mean the defense should somehow be forced to play it. That's not the remedy here. If, if your point is that uh, it needed to be published to the jury, and you mentioned your experience has been exhibits such as maybe medical records on a DVD or mm -hmm. uh, maybe in paper, uh, interrogations are on a DVD, you have video recordings of something, all kinds of things. Mm -hmm. is, is it your position that if all of that is not published to the jury that that is structural error and you're done? No. My position is that in this case, when the defense counsel objects and asserts that his right to have evidence produced, put into evidence in open court, I think that's what triggers it. Because that's the whole idea of a public trial, right? When defense counsel is objecting to the way this is being done, and they're just saying, we're just gonna give this evidence and then the jury can look at it. I think that's gotta be the trigger point. And if that happens, if it was a, as Justice Luke had said earlier, mm -hmm. a documents or DVD stacked to the ceiling mm -hmm. and the state wanted to put them into evidence and there was no objection to putting them into evidence so long as they were quote, published and quote to the jury, then the judge says, we're gonna play it all. The judge, I'm sorry, I'm not sure. The judge says, we're going to publish it. That means, jury, we're going mm -hmm. to play this for you. 
which then enables you to look at this in the jury room mm -hmm. should you desire to do that. I'm mm -hmm. just asking about the practical effect of this. Right, and then at some point, maybe the state's not just going to throw all this information at the jury. I mean, if there's something in particular the state wanted on this video that it wanted the jury to have, then play it for the jury if there's an objection. Don't just throw all this information at the jury. I mean, tell us what, what is important about this evidence. And if you think there was something on this video that you wanted the jury to see, then play some of it. If you wanted to see the, show that the detectives interacted well with the defendant, then show them that. But, but you didn't. You, mm -hmm. you just told me that earlier that you were not a challenging the content and I hear you make an evidentiary arguments as to relevancy or materiality um, and, and we don't have any ch uh, challenge to the content mm -hmm. um, so if you're not alleging that the content of, of the DVDs was inadmissible mm -hmm. um, then I, I don't understand your argument about it might not have been material well, what I'm speaking to is what Justice Ness is saying where what, you're going to force the state to, to play the six-hour video. And all I'm trying to say is, if it's that important, you know, there's got to be something on there the state thought was important, then play it for the jury. And if it's not, then don't play it at all. Any further presentation? No. Any more questions? Thank you, counsel. Thank you. Your Honors, on behalf of the Wyandotte County District Attorney's Office, Ethan Zoe Sigler, I'll be asking that you affirm the judgment <coughs> of the Court of Appeals when they affirmed the conviction of Mr. Sullivan. Um, I believe the first place I'll start is that I, I do not think that there is a public trial issue in this case. Um, this did not involve uh, the presentation of evidence that was unadmitted or any sort of um, presentation to the jury of anything that was objected to uh, outside of a public venue. And I think that's what's distinguishing here. There is no allegation. And that's because the, the uh, uh, DVD or the videotape, whatever it was, uh, was admitted into evidence in open court. Correct. That's your argument. So then it doesn't matter what's on it or what happens with it. If it's admitted in open court, then there's no public trial issue. Correct, Your Honor. And I think that's distinguishable from an event where something is on the DVD that was not contemplated to be on the DVD, uh, where there is information there that parties did not admit into evidence. And that's sent back with the jury. Here, every piece of evidence that was sent back with the jury was contemplated, presented, and admitted in open court subject to objection and, and what was the point of, of, sending, admi of admitting that and sending it back and being unsure whether the jury would just pick out pieces and look at pieces and and not all of it or maybe not even ignore it or or, or let uh, watch the whole thing uh, what was the point of of admitting it I, I can't speak to the attorney who'd made that decision. I know in my cases, when I've done it in the past, it's generally, uh, I'm my the primary place I do it is it's in DUI videos. I will publish parts of the DUI video or that are relevant, but the DUI video may contain half an hour to an hour of the officer driving the person to the station. And I, rather than edit that out and make the jury believe that I'm covering something up, I will just send the whole video back even though we only publish the relevant portions of the video to the jury. Um, so long as everything on the video has been reviewed by the defense counsel and there's no content that is objectionable uh, and it's admitted, I don't see any difference in just playing the relevant portions but sending it all back. Similar to I've admitted hundreds of records of phone records in the past and only published four pages of the phone records that I had. Are, are you familiar with the Ninth Circuit case of um, Nausfar, uh, is how I'm pronouncing it, uh, which says the problem is that sending unplayed tapes to the jury room is such a, uh, is basically a structural defect. 
because it violates the basic framework of the trial system, which requires that evidence be presented and, in, and tested in front of the jury, judge, and defendant. And I'm only marginally aware of it because of reviewing this case and it was cited in the case. Um, my understanding is even though they come to a structural uh, error issue in that, it is based on a federal statute that was uh, applicable at the time and also involved um, the handling of the evidence itself. Uh, it wasn't just about the playing of the videos. Well, let me rephrase it. Uh, what is wrong with the statement that uh, a basic framework of our trial system is that evidence be presented and tested in front of the jury, judge, and defendant? That seems like a fairly um, unimpeachable concept. I, th I think the difference, and I, I don't think that's an incorrect statement, I just believe that it's different when the parties are agreeing to the presentation as it's presented, and that's what we had in this case. Both parties basically acquiesced to the presentation of the video in the way it was presented, neither asked for full publication of the six hour video. You don't, you don't agree with what I understood defense counsel's position to be that there was an objection to admission without publication. I don't agree to, with that. I mean, the objection was just generally, I object to sending this back with the jury with. If there was a right to publication, that, that right could be waived or Correct. abandoned, right? Correct, and at no point did the defense actually ask to publish it, and I think critically, they were given two bites of the apple. The most, you know, the place where they could have asked to admit it was when they were cross-examining the detectives. They could have admitted that, shown the video, asked questions based on it, or you know, at the time the defense counsel is asking and objecting to it being sent out, could say, well, at this point, I want it published to the jury, and this is part of the problem with not having a specific objection. But what if the defendant didn't want it published to the jury, uh, uh, and uh, objects to to send it back? Why can't the defendant object to sending it to the jury without being played, uh, but not ask for it to be published because they don't really want it published? Because if defendant follows earlier pattern, he's going to leave the, the courtroom. Right. And I think part of the problem is that takes it from a structural issue to a substantive issue. If he doesn't want specific parts published for some reason and then does not want those sent back with the jury, we're talking about content. And then we're outside of the structural error issue. We're looking at does the content of these videos and the portions he did not want admitted, do those somehow prejudice him? And then we're not looking at this simply from a structural issue, and it's subject to harmless error. So I think once we get into the issue of, well, did the defendant want the content in, we start asking, well, is the error harmless or not? And I think that's, once we get there, we're not in the same realm. Can I just ask another practical question? Um, I understood what you said earlier that you don't like to send a partial videotape back in a DUI case, for example. Um, you admit the entire thing even though you only publish parts of it because you don't want the jury to think you're hiding something. Um, and that's also true in the hundreds of phone records and you only publish four pages. I mean, at what point does that become kind of ridiculous? Because in some ways this just sounds like yeah, I didn't have time or didn't want to take the extra hour or two to redact. Um, so I'm just going to give the jury 500 pages and they can sort it out. I mean, isn't this just partly the state's job in prosecuting a case to pick the evidence that actually supports their case rather than just vomit it all out into the jury room? And certainly it does, and I do. But there are times, especially with phone records, where if I'm publishing from, like, my example was I was publishing from page one and then page 50. Mm -hmm. If I'm taking out, you know, it doesn't hurt me or in any way impact the jury to see that there are other records there, even though I only reference four pages. But if I take multiple pages out, it can look like I'm hiding things. Can't I mean, the witness explain that? I just, I mean, to me, it seems, I know, it seems kind of lazy, to be honest, to just hand them 500 pages and say, look at pages one 
2 and 14. Well, and the reason I use phone records specifically is that it's the minimal effort to remove those, but it's a specific conscientious choice. Most prosecutors in the modern world are faced with a sort of balancing act between a tight presentation and the fact that the state is generally viewed far more suspiciously uh, than they were even 10 years ago, especially in a jurisdiction like Wyandotte County. I don't get the benefit of wearing the white hat most of the time. I have to prove myself to the jury that I, the person presenting, is trustworthy and oftentimes I do that with small elements of including more presentation than is needed to show that I'm not hiding anything. That's a balancing act. You're correct, Your Honor. I mean, we don't get out of editing any DUI at all. There's always some amount of editing that has to be done, whether it's a defendant invoking their rights, uh, certain rights, a uh, defendant referencing previous actions that can't come in. We have to edit it, but I generally like to include information that isn't necessary in the unedited video to show that what we edit, we edit for the court's reasons, and I'm not trying to hide things. And there being, is a balancing act. Being complete to be credible. Correct. Thank you. I don't have uh, anything else in my presentation, Your Honors. If you have any questions for me, I'd be more than happy to answer any. Your position would be that if there was any error, it's harmless. Correct, and it would be mostly to it would that would be my position. If there were any error, um, it would have been at the time. the The statute didn't provide the mechanism for sending back the replay equipment, uh, and that that was subject to harmlessness analysis. And in this case, that would have been harmless. All right. Any more questions? Thank you, Counsel. Thank you, Your Honor. I would waive rebuttal. We have any questions? All right, thank I, you. Just one, if I may. Um, can you can you articulate specifically how there was how the defense objected to the admission without publication? I think or, she. I'm sorry. Go ahead. I, I cut you off. I'm sorry. Well, no, I I I was done. Thank you. Uh, I think because the whole. When the state went to admit, her very first question was, is the state going to publish this to the jury? And then the state said no. And then she started questioning well, what's going to happen then if they want to watch it. And the judge talked about how he thought it was all OK. But at and the end of all that, there wasn't, well, correct me if I'm wrong, was there ever a definitive, I, if this evidence is going to be admitted, mm -hmm. I want it published to the jury. No. It was all within the context of that was her concern. Or she just did not, she didn't, she listened to the proposal and she didn't agree, she did, she objected after that to what, how, the, how they were going to do it. Well, I'm going to object, no. Any more questions? All right. Thank you, counsel. Thank you. Thank you both for your arguments this morning. Court will take this matter under advisement.